we have a very distinguished speaker today. Uh, that is the consulting engineer. Um, and he has nuclear energy with over 40 years of PRA experience. He's a technical lead for the PSAs working the BWR 300 PTR and natrium reactors. Uh, was the principal investigator for the DOE funded project for the prism reactor on the uh, demonstration of the non light work reactor PRA standard. And was the technical lead for the UK ABWR PSA development completed project. Currently, he's supporting the industry initiative for technical inclusive content of application. You're probably going to hear him about TICAP. TICAP or TICAP, depending on who you are. And, uh, and supported the pilot application of uh, both TICAP and LMP, the licensing modernization project. Uh, Dennis has authored or co authored more than 100 publications, including the recently issued IEA safety analysis report, the safety report called multi unit PSAs. Um, Dennis is the NS chairman of the ANS Semi Joint Committee on Nuclear Risk Management and has supported. PRA standard development since uh, 1999. Prior to coming to GE, then it worked at uh, Duke Power and Target at California Edison, supporting risk informed applications such as risk informed technical specifications and NFA 805. Then it's supported PRA for more than 35 plants around the world. He received his master's and bachelor's in nuclear engineering from the uh, University of Florida. and. We have a special guest today here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it. Thank you for joining. She brought me flowers. Yes, <laughs> yes 1999. I started standard work, and I also have my daughter. So I'll give you your age away. I'm not sure. Um, I've never spoken in a mask before, so if you can't hear me, raise your hand, and I'll speak up. Um, I appreciate the uh, the invite to come here. Uh, I'm with the Chief Engineer's Office of VE Hitachi in Wilmington, just two hours away. And uh, we're hiring, if you're qualified, we got a bunch of openings coming up, working on uh, BWR X300 uh, in Canada, where we're trying to build it there, and then also in Tennessee, hopefully. We're working on the Natrium Reactor with uh, Terra Power which is Bill Gates's company, sodium cool test reactor, versatile test reactor in Idaho, which is a test reactor to build, to test all of the fuel facilities, uh, the fuel and materials reactor testing for non light water reactors, and um, an ARC project, which is another Canadian sodium reactor project. So. And I and I work with the IEA a lot, so I've been over to Turkey to work with the Turkish government to, on the plant that they're building there. And so, anyways, let me get into this. This is work that I did with the IAEA on multi-unit risk assessment. So, as the title says, multi-unit, multiple units go to core damage or have a release at the same time. It's made I me mean, it's a lot worse than a single unit. We've always thought about our single units. Now we're starting to think about it multiple units. So let me go into why why we're doing that. Ready. There we go. So I'm going to talk about it, uh, why why we're doing that, and then I'll go into a little, little bit of history. Um, then I'll go talk about what part. the first work that we did was on a prism reactor, which is the first uh, sodium commercial plant that we've been trying to build. That's the, the base of that's used for VTR and also for the natrium plant. Uh, then I'll talk, the most I'll talk about is the IEA approach and how that document is now kind of first of the kind, only document like it in the world. Um, and then just one little quick discussion about, okay, we learned a lot, but now we have a simple approach. If you want to estimate multiple unit risk, we wrote a paper on how to do that. And then uh, I'll talk about the standard, the PRA standard um, that we're also working on at this point. So, <clears throat> and if you have questions in the middle, feel free to ask. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of acronyms, I'm sorry. Uh, first one is PRA or PSA. 
same thing. European is PSA, US it's PRA, they're the same thing. And I use them both interchangeably, sorry about that. <clears throat> so first, what is, what is PRA? Well, in a, for a nuclear plant, PRA, uh, for those of you who are familiar, uh, we're trying to determine the risk or negative outcome for any facility. It could be a chemical facility, being an aircraft, up for nuclear, what we're worried about is the risk of release to the public, core damage of release to the public. And so we use a mathematical model. So we're big mathematicians. And we analyze the risk of release, uh, both how you can get there, what's the, how do you get there, what's the action sequence that can get you to release, and what the frequency of that is. And the combination of that is the risk for that sequence. And if we do it all together in a mathematical sense, we can combine the risk of multiple sequences. We can combine a low dose release with a high frequency and a high dose release with a low frequency and compare them and sum them up and compare those to the acceptance criteria. In the NRC, it's a quantitative health objectives and we can compare it. So really what we're trying to do is develop these mathematical models to model the risk to the public for a nuclear plant operation. Uh, the output of that can be used for a lot of applications, and I could have many talks about how we do that, isomerization, risk-informed applications, and so on. There's a lot of information you can get from the insights of a PRA. <clears throat> um, so, a little bit of history, uh, starting with the multiple multi-unit PSA, is um, uh, this, this graph here. Any uh, Carl Fleming came last year. Um, yeah. This year was it this year? Yeah, this year. This year. Okay. This year. Yeah. So Carl's Carl's a very good friend of mine. We have a we have a thing that if we make each other mad, then we owe each other a glass of wine. And I think I'm, I'm up to five bottles of wine now that I owe him. So Carl is the father of uh, multi unit PRA. And it really started in the Seabrook PRA, which you may have spoken about in this talk, um, which I summarized here. And this is the alpha graph of that Seabrook PRA. And what it shows is that when you look at uh, one unit and the other unit, and then we look at a multiple unit release and you sum them up. The sum of it is more than the sum of the individual because they interact, because they are, um, for many units, um, has anybody been to Oconee, the Oconee unit? Oconee's in South Carolina, just on, um, just near the Georgia border, three unit site, and it turns out 70% of the site risk, if there's a one unit core damage, there are two unit core damage. And about 50% of the time, there's a three unit core damage. And if you could imagine that, you're thinking that you have a certain source term, you have a, you have a core, you're going to melt it, and you're going to release a certain amount. 50% of the time, you're releasing three times the amount you thought you were. So if you're an emergency planner, well, wow, that's a big deal. So Carl, produced some graphs for Seabrook and said, hey, you need to think about this. Well, unfortunately, 25, 30 years go by, nobody cares. Right? <laughs> so um, the results are there. I did some work for Oconee. We did some for emergency planning, but nothing really ever happened for multi-unit. So but we, don't, we knew how we could do it, just nobody required us to do that analysis. Um, then Fukushima happened, right? Fukushima. I mean, how many how many units were affected by the Great Japanese Earthquake? Anyone know? Four. Four. How many were affected? Two. Now, affected means overall. Thirteen. Something like yeah. that. Four, I don't know. Okay. Like so, how many went to court average? There's three. You know, four at Fukushima, uh, da uh, Daiichi was in shutdown. They were very lucky. And the other two units were ABWR. Yeah, ABWR. They were higher up. 
And then Naini had several units. They had a, another unit on Agawa, had a seismically this fire. And then they had one other site that had several units affected. Luckily, the tsunami only hit Taichi. But they went three units to go to Cordero. And if you would look at the analysis, if there was only one unit on the site, it would not have been a core damage because they could have brought the portable pump in to the one unit. They had one portable pump for three units. And they kept going back and forth and they couldn't say any of it. Now, there were aspects of Fukushima that you probably can't have a read about. Uh, unit one and unit two share a control room. Right? Unit one has an isolation condenser. Right, so isolation condenser starts, it's passive, it's the oldest one of the oldest PWRs in the world. Great design though. They started, they, they isolated for some reason. We still don't know the exact reason. But the unit one control room saw that unit two was going into distress and they were distracted by unit two. And so then they uh, forgot about their own unit. Okay, so then they come back to their own unit, unit one, and they say, we need to do something. So they went outside and they ran temporary hosing and then unit two detonated and blew up the unit one hosing. And so then they took some time to rerun it and just to, re, uh, to restart injection. They, the units interacted, right? If they would have had one injection pump, and they didn't share operators, didn't share control rooms. Unit one easily would have been prevented from core damage. Uh, the other units, maybe, maybe not. It's hard to say. This interaction is what we're trying to figure out. What's the probability? What's the likelihood of that occurring? Now, the first thing we learned is an event like an earthquake or a tsunami, it doesn't affect one unit. It affects all the units. So we shouldn't be analyzing it one unit at a time. We need to analyze all the units at a time and think about, do we have enough people, resources? Um, can they interact? Can I, if I get a dose relief on one unit, can it affect the other unit? Do I have, is my control room on the other unit able to handle the dose release from a single before they have it on the other unit? Those are the sort of questions they ask from Fukushima. <clears throat> we didn't ask them before, that's the problem. So that's what we're trying to ask at this point. Um, so that's really what caused us to restart this work was Fukushima. And the IAEA, as well as in the US and the UK and other countries, they started asking questions. Now, outside of PSA, they had the, the NRC response in the US, they had a similar response overseas. Um, in the near-term near task force, I worked out loud of the response to that. Um, on we inserted, we put flex pumps in the in the units. Uh, anybody know the, how many trains of flex would be needed for a two-unit site? Train. Anybody know the answer? Three. Three. N plus one. Everything's N plus one, right? Why? Because Fukushima had one. Now in Europe, some countries have. Only one required for two units. They still haven't learned. Slovenia, in our pilot plant, you'll see it here in a little while for the IEA, the actual requirement is only one flex part for two units. And we recommend that they change that. Uh, three pumps for two units, four pumps for three units, and plus one. Learn from Fukushima. Yeah, so, so they have a lot of um, response to that. I put some links on the presentation, which you can get on the overall response to that. Um, but overall, we what we did was improve our response to external hazards. We still haven't improved the response from multiple unit or damage events, but we at least have gotten rid of multiple unit hazard issues. Um, there are at least three units that went back and looked at external flooding mainly in the Midwest where there are rivers and the rivers are now higher than they ever were. And they inspected their, their, their site and these walls, they should have been sealed. And they inspected them and they weren't sealed. So if they would have had a flood event, 
water through the walls, flood out through diesels, flood out through batteries, same thing you have for the machine. So, uh, so that, that was really a good response. The MRC did an excellent job in trying to get the industry to respond for seismic events. Everybody reevaluated their seismic hazard, uh, external flooding, tornadoes, hurricanes, high winds, and make sure that you remove vulnerabilities, re reduce the overall risk. Again, from a single unit standpoint. <clears throat> um, now, again, continuing on, um, we started looking at it from a risk standpoint. And we said, well, we need to rethink what they did at Seabrook. And Carl Fleming kept talking to us saying, no, we need to think about this. And so the IEA listened, UK listened, and we were IEA members. And they started this work at the IEA, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but the main, the main thing, um, you know, they, they concluded one is, you know, from the past work and the work we did early, multiple unit risk is really hazards, external hazards. Anything that comes off this from offsite can affect all the units simultaneous. So you'll, if you get a core damage in one, you'll get a core damage in another. So um, they, they saw that from previous results, and we've since verified that's, that's what happens. Um, one of the biggest things, though, is a list here on the bottom, small modular reactors. We're not building one reactor on the site. We're not building two. Anybody know how many new scale is putting on the site? Is that one? No, I got it. It's like eight. I think, I think the last time I heard 10, but it's modular, so you can pick and choose, right? You can have many more, but right now they're, they're talking about 10. Koreans have a site going in with 10. You know, SMRs are, uh, one of the things they're trying to do is um, price it out, like X300, price it out at a billion dollars, a lot of money, but still people can come up with a billion dollars. You build a reactor, you get it operating, you build the next one. Get it operating, build the next one, build the next one. Pretty soon you got eight, 10 reactors on one site, and you can provide enough power for Toronto or you know Washington, DC, or wherever you want to provide power. But it takes a lot of these. And the problem is you have one flood, you have one earthquake, they all react the same. The response is the same. If you have a vulnerability, the vulnerability is the same. And so we could be talking about a very small reactor, which we think is very safe because it has a very small radioactive footprint. But 10 reactors or 12 reactors, that's like a, you know several big reactors. So uh, that's really the, the reason we need to think about this more. We can't think about risk and PRA all by itself for single units. You have to think about it for multiple units. So that's why we started our work on multi-unit risk assessment. Uh, let me talk about PRISM. So PRISM uh, is a G design similar to the EDR2 reactor in Idaho, cool type sodium fast reactor, passive air cooling called RVAX, uh, passive shutdown with in our reactivity feedback, numerous passive features. So very safe, it is sodium, so it can catch fire, so they have sodium fire, atmosphere, no locas, none of the severe accident issues that we have with water reactors, no hydrogen issues, no hydrogen detonations. Um, and so we've had this, the prism reactor in design since like, 1988, is approved by SCR from by the NRC to be built. Nobody ever wanted to build it. They want to continue to move forward water reactors. Fukushima happens. They said, well, let's go revisit that. Uh, nobody wants to build a, the super big uh, AP1000 reactors anymore. It's too expensive or take too long. And so we run that prison. So we uh, did a prison PRA update. Part of that was to, to update the methodologies for PRA. 
but also um, to test out the uh, PRA standard, the, uh, the ANS, ASMEs, US standard on the non live water reactor standards. It is a draft of the trial use. We were the trial use that government paid us to try it and fix it, and it was very successful. I was a principal investigator on that project. Uh, two and a half years, did all of the risk assessment for all hazards, all roads. Um, and so I have a little bit of a summary here. Um, so there's just a, a link to, uh, although you have to request access, I'm sorry, the link is there, but the Department of Energy wants you to request access to the report. But there is a public report on the prism that of the work we did is really to develop methodology and share it with the world on how to do a non light water reactor PRA. And uh, very successful, had 13 volumes of work. Uh, we had some uh, 20 something people working on that. So a lot of effort. That's our prism reactor. Um, uh, if you want to look at it a little bit later, the Passive air cooling comes through the uh, ductwork here, goes around the vessel, back up out through the ductwork, four, four inlets, four outlets, air comes in, it's always on. It's, you're removing half a percent of the reactor power at all times. You shut down, reactor heats up, you can go up to about three and a half percent heat removal from air. Nothing has to move, no ducts have to open, no. Valves have to open. Um, highly reliable between 10 to minus 6 and 10 to minus 8, depending on the scenario and the reliability. And it's much more reliable than a regular component. Um, that's the main difference uh, besides being atmospheric. Uh, sodium reactor, sodium has its issues. Main thing on a sodium reactor, though, is a huge pool uh, that can absorb a lot of heat. Uh, you can shut off the secondary side and continue to operate for eight to 10 hours. The sodium will absorb it. It's a huge heat reservoir. It's great. Good heat transfer characteristics. Um, and I'll, hopefully, I'll talk a little bit later about natrium. We, we're putting molten salt on the backside of this, doing new molten salt storage, as well as the load file. And so, if you take the prism reactor, put a molten salt storage on it. That's natrium, um, the basic design of the natrium plant. <clears throat> we didn't you know, make all this up. This was similar to EDR2. Now, but the way we did do what was different. Um, the reactor itself had an enemy loop going to a steam generator. Steam generator fed a turbine, turbine creates power. <laughs> Amazing. Really? Uh, yeah. But some um, sharply sura. Somebody, can I mute, please? Um, I'm in the in Westland. I'm going to be a little sura on a hit the team. Two units, uh, two units in a single steam generator. And so what we have is the other module here: uh, feed water and steam come from the other unit feed in one term generator, two units. So we immediately have an issue with the steam line break, feed line break, loss of feed water. That's all uh, shared within the unit. So we, we immediately created a, a scenario where we have multi unit effects. And we thought it was important enough that we ran a multi unit PRA on it. And we did that. And here's just a description of it. Of it. We didn't complete all scenarios and all modes and all hazards for the multi unit, but we did create a methodology document. That supported that that we, sh we share with the other street um, on how to do this evaluation. And there's just an outline of the various steps. So sorry for the acronyms. But I should have had assigned somebody to count acronyms. <laughs> it was like uh, probably 57 acronyms or something like that. Or, or as my daughter would say, 73.2 acronyms. <laughs> That's a joke there, so. Um, and what it is, this is standard core damage modeling, uh, success, uh, the success criteria, radio link light release, uh, transport offsite, integrated into a risk integration model, 
just like I said, some of the low frequency and the high frequency signals of low dose, high dose signals of and the offset dose, dose of the site boundary, acute risk, chronic risk. You can, you can look at different risk metrics for the same, same type of monitoring. So we developed that the, the standard, the PRA standard, non live water reactor standard, has the sections of the standard based on these. Um, this breakdown of the work structure. Um, so we developed, as I mentioned, this uh, approach. We share with the IAEA. I'll talk about the three phase IAEA approach. Um, we developed it with, along with the IAEA. And we, we use the same approach that they uh, agreed upon in the phase one of the work. And uh, we, use, we share that with the Valley Water Reactor Standard. And then we've just been improving on that approach since then. Um, that's just a flow chart of the uh, of the simplified approach. Um, we select the scope, select the risk metrics. I think I have a graph here on risk metrics, but uh, uh, we we have all new risk metrics for multi-unit. We have you don't have the core damage frequency anymore. You have either multi-unit core damage or site core damage. And multi unit is two or more, two or more units going to core damage, and site is the sum of all single and multiple units with site. So we select our metrics, um, start with a single unit PRA, uh, analyze the initiating events, determine which initiating events affect multiple units, and which ones don't. The loss of offsite power affects multiple units, right? Uh, LOCA on a single unit doesn't. So we look at which ones are single unit, which ones are multiple unit. And then multi unit scenarios, we develop our dead sequence model. Um, we look at the multiple uh, unit event sequence modeling, uh, determine the source term, radiological consequence, integrated, and then we get our um, multi unit results. Uh, we can present those a number of ways. Uh, simple process that has a lot of details really in the event sequence modeling. I won't go through too much of that. Yes. Uh, so based on what you were talking about earlier, it's not necessarily true, right, that one unit has to go near core damage before the, the, the second unit becomes vulnerable. I mean, mostly because of human operations or time pressure and things like that. Um, does that fit in as an initiating event for the second unit um, when you're modeling it, or how do you handle that? Yeah, if it, if, uh, and in fact, let me give you an example. Um, you can have a, a, an event that starts on one unit but affects multiple units and causes a core damage on the second unit. Probably the most common one is a turbine generator uh, disintegration event, right? Throws a blade, blade goes flying, hits the other unit. I'm just safety, safety equipment. First unit just lost turbine generator. Second unit lost safety equipment. So then the second unit goes to core damage. And it wasn't the scenario we would have thought about unless we thought about the first unit. So yeah, you have to look at shared equipment, um, propagation of fire from one unit to another, propagation of flood from one unit to another. So yeah, it doesn't always have to go to core damage. On uh, both units to be in the analysis. The French, the French participated in our IEA study. They actually they build all our units in force, and they they re looked at the methodology and reconsidered their PRAs. And they said that if some units, when they reconsidered from even from a single unit sample, they were underestimating their risk by fifty percent because of impact from other units. So impacts from other units can be a big impact. Yeah, good question. Um, so what what we what we did in our in our prison PRA was look at uh, three of the QHOs similar to the or basically from the NRC quantitative health sectors, right? So we had um, prop fatalities; those would die immediately. Uh, cancer risk, and then at site boundary, we see that all those sort of uh, 0.2 seawards at basically at a half mile on the site boundary. 
And so we look at risk different ways. And uh, we actually use all three. Like when we, when we calculate a, something that's risk significant, for us, we calculate all three and said if it was risk significant to one, it was risk significant overall. So the one I agree was risk significant to one, which they chose. And more recently for LMP, we're picking one, which is the last one, site boundary risk. And then we calculate risk significance based on that. But we calculated those all three of the quantitative applications. Um, we did look at multi unit events. As I said, we didn't have time to do the whole list of things, but as you saw from the diagram on PRISM, we looked at you know, steam line break, feed line break, lot of subsite power, and then turbine generator faults uh, to start with. We analyzed that we've with a passive reactor, these these lots of outside power events are less important. Lots of feedwater events are less important. Um, but seismic, we knew seismic was going to be the big one. Basically, if you had a and you'll see later in the results, if you have a core damage on one unit due to a seismic event, it doesn't matter what plant you are in the world, if you have an identical unit next to it, 90% probability the other unit is going to go to prayer. 70%, 90%, something like that. It's a very large number. We didn't do that, but we've done it on paper with, you know, kind of simple, simple calculation. Roughly 90% of the time you'll go to core damage for those seismic units. The other units, not so much. And that's not so much the multi unit risk issue. It's why are we going to advance react? What's the beauty of SMRs? Station blackout, lots of tech power, station blackout caused by external hazards. Not important. It's not important for most SMRs. We, we have passive cooling. We don't really care about it. Whereas a, a plant here like Sharon Harris, you know, just down kind of south of Raleigh, uh, they lose offsite power, they lose their diesels to station blackout. They're, you know, probably 10% of the time they'll go to core damage because you know, there's an older uh, PWR would have a high vulnerability station. Like SMRs, we don't have that issue. So the types of things we're worried about turn out not to be an issue. It's seismic, and it turns out also because we have this these air cooling, anything affects the air cooling, tornadoes, high winds, that can also affect multiple units. That can give us a very high core, multiple core damage fields. Yes. Um, in so either here or in the non LWR standard, um, to what degree do you consider multi hazards uh, uh, basically together at the same time? Uh, we we can. There's a whole group of those. Um, the, the standard is not requiring currently random hazards. They have to be uh, coincident or coexistent or have some cause from one to the other. Uh, but to have a random event, um, the, the only time I take that, there's one exception. If a hazard is has a very high likelihood, like the Midwest, they have two plants that had the like Cooper had this flood that surrounded the unit. So you have a high external flood frequency. And at that point, we're, the standard will require you to look at tornadoes or other hazards that may occur during that time. But otherwise, an earthquake and a meteorite or, you know, you know they're random, probably having simultaneous would allow you that to be <coughs> not considered. We want to focus on the, um, the things that are most likely. And that is a good question. Coexistent hazards, another. <coughs> Thing we're working on, we have an IE report that will be out next year on coexistent hazards because there's no methodology to document how to do that. And so we have a methodology document that we'll publish next year uh, on that. And that will be important. Um, and I could pick any unit. South Texas, moderate, South Texas is a TWR, Westinghouse, down off the Rio Grande River. Uh, moderate seismic risk, believe it or not, it's not that not that small. And upstream on the Rio Grande River are three dams: seismic event, dam breaks, water flow site. You know, just like Fukushima, 
So those sorts of hazards are required to be analyzed. Uh, single single or multiple. Um, in a success criteria analysis, the, as I mentioned, the one of the keys on a sodium reactor was really looking at um, the the independence or dependence of the operation of our passive reliability systems, RBAX, IRF, and so on. And we did some pretty advanced analysis on that. Uh, I provided one slide on, on this. We ran, uh, are you guys running SASIS or SAS 4 s So SAS, we ran SASIS, like 770 cases to look at various things. I think I, uh, we looked at, we looked at the six major factors that affect the RVAX operation, uh, you know, airflow, uh, heat transfer, uh, friction, all the factors that we have listed here. And we looked at them, whether they can uh, interact, whether they're highly dependent on each other or independent. We put some factors in there and we did sensitivities on it. And we came up with something like this. This is a passive reliability. Uh, so if anybody here working on passive reliability? Somebody working on passive? I was going to offer you a job. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we're here. Well, um, you said you said um, you think so. I'm being cautious. <laughs> and and what we have here is the basic black number here is looking at the reliability RMAX for a single unit. So it said, you know, depending on it, we ran this uh, for every emission event, and this happened to be a loss of flow event on the primary, and we can see that the we have different fuel damage zones, but the fierce fuel damage zone is just below 1,000 K and somewhere in the 10 minus 8. This is a very reliable system, right? 10 minus 8, that we will exceed the temperature by which we start the damage. Now, we won't get damage, we don't predict damage of all the fuel, uh, but we predict two, two of the fuel zones will damage uh, as a result. But it, you know, we're talking 10 minus 11. I presented this to Dr. Apostolakis. Have you guys anybody heard him speak? He made me cross out all the numbers. <laughs> uh, below 10, I say. He yeah. said, they, like, can't believe it. it. Can't believe it. So that's that story. Um, so, but then we ran this with, with dependency, and then we found that we, we got the red results here. And then we you know, divided the two, and we got a conditional. Uh, core damage free probability that the second RBAX will fail given the first RBAX fail. That's really the most important factor for us in multi unit for non external event uh, kind of thing. And you can see uh, we're somewhere in the 10 to minus 3 probability that the second unit will do a core damage given the first unit's of core damage due to RBAX. Uh, so we, we, this is the type of thing you have to run for multi unit. It's not, it's, not simple. This is just one example of success criteria where SASIS um, that we ran and uh, gave us some pretty good results. And once we saw it, it made, it made sense. Um, and you can see the numbers there. Uh, multi unit risk is, is a very small percentage of a two unit um, sodium reactor from lots of flow, lots of power, and so on. Well, uh, for, for seismic, that number is not correct. Seismic is 3.9, 47, something like that. So, uh, but then we were just trying out the procedure to make sure it worked. We provided that to the IEA, and that's the subject of the um, next uh, portion of the presentation, which is the IE report, which is the work in, in multi unit uh, PRA right now. That's available, publicly available. Um, and I'll, I'll just talk about that. The report um, started with three phases. Um, as I mentioned, Carl Fleming uh, started with the phase one report. Um, uh, another person ran the phase two report, and I, I ran the phase three report. It was the primary author on the final report that came out. Uh, and I'll just talk quickly about the different phases. So the phase one was just develop the methodology. Prism was an input to that. Other other sites, the Seabrook work was also an input to that. 
Uh, phase two, we did a actual pilot. We, we couldn't find a four unit site that would volunteer, so we created a fake four unit site in Slovenia with uh, two older VBR 440s and two new VBR 440s and uh, applied some engineering judgment on what they would look like, developed dependency factors for them, and then created uh, an output for risk uh, based on, uh, on what we thought the results would be. <clears throat> now, the, the actual results are, are meaningless. It was just really to try the method, ask the questions. I mean, what are, what's really important, what's not important? Now, it turns out shared flex bumps is important. Now, we could have told them that. So they have two flex pumps for four units because of the existing insulin unit will only require one for two units. And so that became the big factor. Um, multi unit effect, right? Shared equipment, just like a food chain. Um, dose release between units, not as important as we thought it was. It was important for Fukushima. Uh, and it really brought up some questions. Um, if you are if you have two identical units, they look, they will follow the same action uh, flow pattern. If you have two different units side by side, and one unit's doing well, one unit's not doing well, but one that's not doing well will bring the other one down. It will impact the other unit. So dose impacts for dissimilar units are important. Uh, not for similar units, we found. It's that was our conclusion. Um, and then phase three, we took the lessons from phase two and we created a final report. And I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so overall, we had, like I said, three phases. The first uh, first phase, low rails, more than three, actually took five years of all told. And how many trips to Vienna did I make? About a dozen. She's never been. So, not yet. I'm going to March. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we, we supported with our prison theory. We also, during that time, we were working on a project for the advanced boiling water reactor in the United Kingdom. Got it all designed, and the, and the regulator was happy, and then they canceled it. So, beautiful plan, ABWR. Uh, and I was the lead on the PRA for that effort. So at the time, the most advanced PRA in the world was nothing close to it. I think even still, not too close to that. Where did you answer it? Uh, politics. <laughs> uh, it was really with, with Brexit and the financing and uh, UK government wouldn't commit to it. was all they asked for is 30. One UK government put 30% of the cost down. And then we covered the other two thirds. Uh, so they canceled it. Um, so but we did a multi unit PRA for that year. Uh, using our uh, modified method uh, from PRISM. Overall, excellent, excellent work. The regulator was very happy with that. Um, and so uh, that, that, that supported the overall approach for the initial phase one, one report. Um, the phase two was, I mentioned it several times, a four unit made up site. Um, and I mentioned the author of it, or the Elfo, the Slovenian company, uh, did some really good work, math, good mathematical work. Um, the math is difficult math is, because we're talking about dependency and correlation, like with seismic, it's a, you know, are we going to correlate diesel generators on different units? Are they the same diesel generator? How correlated are they? And ask all those questions on that. And once you answer the question, then you have to put it in a mathematical format. So we looked at different different aspects of correlation and put that all into the model, and then we came up with some nice results. And that our report is, is available, um, and I, I supported that. And then um, there were we looked at uh, really uh, four sets of sequences, but the two main ones, you know, we're looking at loss of site power and seismic. Seismic was a big one. Um, we did uh, for the the Slovenian pilot. They looked at fire in the turbine general uh, turbine building, and one other sequence. We, we looked at the sequences. 
And we published them if anybody would like to see that. It's, it's a um, conference that we put together in a Munich conference that uh, published the report. Uh, in the meantime, the Koreans got interested because the Korean lawmakers make it law. They have to do a multi unit. So the Koreans now require them to do this. So they got very interested, started sending three or more people to all of these. And then they started looking at multi unit risk assessment. Uh, and they published some results on some of the higher, harder mathematics associated with common cause, dependencies, correlations between units. It's really very hard to uh, model uh, correctly. Um, and what we found was I think I mentioned this uh, it, earlier, it's not as low as we had for prism, but the types of things we normally were about loss of upside power common internal end kind of things, you're getting pretty low numbers, one to two percent correlation between units. So if you have a loss of thick hour and you go to core damage on one unit, the probability of the other unit will go to core damage is about one percent. Not that bad. It depends. If you have um, uh, if you have the same type of equipment and you share equipment, that number could go up to six or seven percent. If you have different diesels, different manufacturers, and then we figure out to 21% or something. One to two percent is roughly about what you get. Um, now, with new and old units, that number gets very, very low. I think I have a table here that shows you the results of that. Um, let's see. Now, I think I removed that. I have too much detail in there. But between new and old units, the number goes very low. So with a four unit or two units, two old units, the number is very low. But for seismic, um, the number is very high, 0.7 to 0.8%. Now, with 40 units, with two old and new units, there is not a, they're not directly correlated. But the answer of it is you can do the math and it's in the simplified methodology. <laughs> The newer units are more robust. They're, they can handle a larger earthquake. And the, and the answer is if the new units go to core damage, the old units are already there. So you can calculate the number with an abacus or a slide rule because it's pretty simple to figure out. All you have to know is what's the core damage frequency for the new units and for the size but you know, something like that. So, uh, so we were able to show that, but the lesson learned is for us in, in multi units, seismic is super important, but any external hazard that can affect multiple units is really what you want to know. Internal events, loss of the car, less, less important. Yes. Um, so I, I see what you mean from the external uh, hazard perspective, but in terms of the common cause failure modes, uh, both for similar units and dissimilar units, what do you see are the uh, I guess system level common cause failure modes uh, or component level that you know come to mind, I guess. Um, complicated question. I'll give you the two simplest ones. Um, most units have a, a turbine driven pump, right? Those turbine driven pumps are one in each unit and they're usually considered separately. Um, between two units that both have a turbine driven pump, you have a new common cause grouping that you didn't have in a single unit that has a very high correlation. Uh, we don't normally, like for diesels, we test one, one, and then two weeks later we test the other, and we do staggered testing. We're not doing staggered testing between units, so of course the common cause between those is high. The, the other one is diesels, and the problem is you may put different diesels on there. You may even have a third diesel on a unit that has a different design than a different manufacturer. Has the same oil. So we have people bring the wrong oil and feed it to all their diesels. And if they would have started it, it would have failed the diesels. And you can fail it for every unit on the site uh, from the same fuel source uh, problem. So that was probably the biggest problem. Um, So the safety report, the phase three report, I put a link to it here. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I was a primary author of that. That was really take those lessons, make a methodology. How would 
how would you guys go and do a multi unit uh, analysis for an example plant? If you're going back to Turkey and you wanted to build a, a PSA model for the two unit DVR 1000s they're building there, uh, how would you do that? Well, the methodology reports there, it's like a procedure. Very simple. Uh, well, not just that was hard, but, but it's there. It's a teacher tells you how to do it. And that's the that's the steps. The procedure goes a little more complicated than the prism one you saw earlier. And I won't go through it in great detail, but we're looking at the the common cause factors uh, that you worry about are uh, are the systems interacting? Are they the same system? Do they have common cause? Human reliability? Do the operators interact? Are there one controller or two? Same training, same procedure, same and response, and then do we have correlation and common cause between the units? And this modeling here really tells us what we're going to get out at the, at the end of that. <clears throat> so again, you know, do your PSA, do your modeling, integrate it, quantify it, and then get the results out. And then uh, that, that gives you <clears throat> the results in whatever metric you're using. Now we we use a metric. Um, which is basically conditional probability of the second unit, uh, multi, the multi unit ratio. We made it a new term, multi unit ratio. Probably that the second unit goes to whatever risk uh, we worry about, at least, or according to given the first one. Um, but there were other, other um, possible metrics. I've just been mentioning a few. Um, I mentioned earlier site. This is looks like a three unit site. Site risk is the sum of all three units, but then multi-unit is, it depends on what you're looking at. For, for this, if unit one and unit 10 go, go to core damage, it's this intersection, all three units go, it's the dark one, that's a three unit core damage, and so on. So that's the you know, Venn diagram of how that would all look. Um, and that's, so multi-unit could be any of these uh, four possible combinations. And we would actually calculate each one of those uh, on our PSA. But that's what we're trying to calculate. We're trying to do math, get all that right. Um, so overall, you know, we uh, were very successful. Um, in fact, the IEA team, I was there a couple months ago and they took me out to town and they won a big award from the IEA uh, because of the work they did um, really exceptionally uh, well received around the world, uh, especially for countries like Korea and the UK that are requiring this now. This has a, this tells them this is how you do it, and there wasn't a document like that before. Um, so really, overall acceptable. Um, now that said, I, I mentioned earlier there's a um, the lessons learned. Really, we took and I, I wrote a paper for the PSA conference. That, that gives you the summation of that. It's, it's, the math is not that hard, which is if you know the risk of seismic and you know the risk of hazards for individual units or, or risk of hazards that can affect multiple units, and then we know the risk from single unit uh, impacts like loss of offset power and so on, you can calculate by hand the multi unit risk and bound it, get a bounding number. And that's all in this paper. Actually, there was an NRC person who came up with an approach. Um, I didn't like their approach. The math was wrong. They, <laughs> the problem was actually the question you asked earlier, which is uh, one unit affected the other unit, the other unit affected. And it was triple counting mm -hmm. events uh, in the math to get the math on. So I rewrote it, published a report. That actually went into the an appendix to the IEA report. But so you don't have to do really super mathematical models. If you have the single unit PSA results for a two unit site, you can calculate about what the multi unit risk is in, in a few minutes. Really. So that paper is available. Um, and if you're not able to get that from the NS site, just send me an email. I'll be happy to send it. Um, last, last slide. Um, uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, I'm the chair and this chair for the TRA standards, uh, Joint Committee on Nuclear uh, Risk Management, JCNRM. 
Uh, we represent um, organizations around the world. We have 35 meeting members. Um, I'm an average age on the committee. So. <laughs> Uh, but then on the subcommittee's working groups, we have some 220 TSA experts from around the world. And we, we have seven standards, but which we put out of several guidance documents. And uh, we have the non live water rate standard, live water rate standard, uh, low power shutdown standard, level two, which is released from the containment, level three, which is close to the public. And then now we have the multi unit standard. Oh, in advanced slide water, I understand. Sorry. Um, so we have all these standards either in development or completely developed now. The multi unit standard is the last one we developed. We are working on that now based on the IEA document. And so I just I just mentioned that on the last slide. We are working on developing the standard. Now, what's the standard, PRA standard for us? Um, it's complicated, but I'll, I'll bring it down to a couple of concepts. One is a standard tells you what you have to do, create a PRA of sufficient quality to apply for risk application. So the non high water reactor standard came out, we have some 1,270 requirements. A lot of requirements. It's complicated to do a PRA, it's not simple. Um, and so each one of them is the minimal set of things you have to do to create a quality PRA. The second aspect of that is the, the industry has developed a process of peer review. And a peer review means you bring in an ex, ex, six experts or so externally from the orga, organization that have not worked on the original work, review your work against the standard and tell you how you're doing. They'll assess you against the requirements and then write findings or observations, or findings or suggestions. Uh, there are basically deficiencies against the standard. The reason we did that was because we were sending our PR PRAs to the NRC, and the NRC doesn't have enough qualified people. And the quality of reviews we got was, you know, it varied, right? We get some were okay reviews, some we they just make comments that make no sense. Sometimes they review it, didn't find anything, and then we come back later and say it was all wrong. So better to have you know people with gray hair that can come in have done it before they review your work they tell you where your problems are you fix them and then you say i have a quality PRA. so that's what this is about is now if you create a standard and you go to do a multi unit PRA, and you you can have a peer review and then you can tell that you have a quality result uh, so that should be uh, completed late next year we hope it's slower than it should have been, but well, that's what we're trying to develop. And that'll be the last of the standards of the seven standards we have published next year. And I think that's all I have. So I, I left uh, 90 seconds for questions. <laughs> <laughs> no more questions. Oh, yes. Question in chat. How is it? Just from what about you consider performance under such circumstances, especially with the possibility of a single main control room controlling multiple SMR Yes, I mean, that's an important aspect. I think, um, I think what we did in past PSAs was neglected uh, to ask the question whether you're in a shared control room and you have. Two events going at one time. If you look at the HRA methodology, human reliability methodology, they, they don't really ask that question. Yeah. They do ask about resources. Like if you have one operator that is going to have to do the same thing on both on two units, they do ask that question. But they don't ask about the interaction between units. Right. So if you have the same thing going on in one unit and you're in front of me, right, and you and you say, okay, stopping injection pump A. I go, oh, I better go stop my injection pump. So if you make a mistake on your unit, I'll probably go make the same mistake on you. There's a lot of interaction. And yeah, we are requiring them to look at that in more detail. And so it's a difficult technical question, but it's hard to understand 
combat of international global. So the operators will tell you there is now no active account. No. You saw Fukushima, that was one of the problems, right? They were all being dictated outside of the organization and they all the same. Yeah, I think what he's alluding to is really are the HRA methodologies ready to handle more beyond uh, the answer is mostly not. And the same goes for any other methodology that we're looking for data analysis, virtual channels, small data channel hazards. Are, are they ready to handle what they even what they have to I, and I would say the methodologies can handle it if we can tell them what to do. Like if we say consider uh, dependencies between units, and you go to look at the axis of sequence timing, and you look at the if you look at one action on one unit and another action on another unit, you see they fail on this unit. Immediately, the dependency model will tell you um, depending on the action between. Um, 10 and 30 percent probability of second will fail. In the third model, for example, it would be something like that. If you ask the question, well, currently the methodology is built to ask you that. So the standard will ask you to do that. So I think the HRA methodology can ask you to do that, but um, the, and the methods are there. It is, we, we have a little way to go on application. The, the one thing we don't have is outside of control, like if you if you have two flex pumps and you go to do one and go to the other, what's the dependency on two different operators in two different locations? Current methodology says no dependency. Different locations, different operators, no dependency. That's, we know that's not true, because they have the same training, same procedures, same atmosphere, same thing going on. So there must be some dependency. I think that's where it falls down. Outside of control methodology, I'm not prepared for that. I have a follow up question. Sure. With your experience, do you think there should be significant effort to separate units as much as possible? Like um, everything, every aspect you can think of, including those trains you just mentioned? Um, yes, I, I, think the, I think the current requirements are they in the NRC and overseas, <clears throat> no shared system. You know, the, the units uh, here in North Carolina, McGuire and Catawba, they have shared service water and cooling water systems, right? So you look at multi-unit risk at Catawba and McGuire, you have a high possibility of a loss of cooling water common to both units going the core range. So the requirements now for advanced reactors, they can't share systems. But now non-safety, like if you want to send a turbine generator, it's probably not a big deal. But for anything that's safety related, yeah, you can't can't share, it. and it's the current requirement. Now, should they be spatially separated? I don't, I don't think that matters as much. Palo Verde, and I worked at Palo Verde for several years. They're spatially separated, but it hasn't helped them on the risk. Uh, you still have the same hazard. Hazard's not limited by thirty feet or fifty feet. Or you know, hazard's going to hit you. you know, Five hundred that will hit the whole area. So. Special separation room really help to help, but no shared systems, no shared controls is, is very important. But the new scales, some of the reactors, the many units that we have would have more control over the many units. SMR, that's an interesting aspect because what they have are uh, no operator action, hands off for seven days. That's a different. So control room, the, the, the answer is different because you don't have to. You don't have to have the operator work. Yeah, I wrote a procedure, a safety procedure for a passive reactor, which is um, event happens, trip the reactor, go to lunch. Just go to lunch. <laughs> That's the same thing you can do right now. Just go to lunch, come back. Um, and then because they don't have to have any action to that. So, um, so I think for those types of reactors, the answer is a little bit different. But they definitely shouldn't be sharing safety systems. Anybody study a can do reactor at all? I don't know. That's, I, I mean, they share a lot. They share containment, right? They share, I mean, there's a lot of share there. They, when you look at a multi unit on a can do reactor, it's very common. And they have a very high conditional probability of core damage, fuel damage for internal mass. Um, you know, their version of LOCA, whatever, two, two brushes. So, so the, 
So that's an example of where you shouldn't have shade. More questions? One last question. Um, I mean, you mentioned at the beginning that you work for GE, but you don't work for Terra Power and Versa and IMF. Is like a cooperation with all, all the companies or? So, so the work with TerraPower is a uh, Natrium is being built as a joint venture between uh, TerraPower and GE. We're the designer, and they're the final uh, company to build it. So we're working with them. I I was on a call with them on the way up there. So um, work with the IAEA. I call it my volunteer work. I do it on the weekends. So, okay. geez, so you, allows you me to do that. You mentioned about the UK, um, the ABWR. That was a GE project. So the IEEE did it for them, right? The no, UK, UK was GE project. It, it was actually Hitachi GE, our, oh, okay. our sister company in Japan. But yeah, so yeah, we're, you know, the Fukushima the units, Fukushima one was built by GE. So, hate to say that. But yeah, so we build plants around the world, Germany, all around the world. So. But not the UK, apparently. All right, thank you, Steve, a lot more. We have more questions. We're going to end the recording, and the speaker is happy to stay here and answer another question. Okay.